Professor Dzinski is a professor in bioethics and humanities and past chair from 2014 to 2022 with joint appointment in pediatrics division and bioethics and palliative care at University of Washington. She is also a fellow of the Hastings Center and is chief of the University of Washington Medical Ethics Consultation Service and director of organizational ethics at Seattle Children's Hospital. She earned her PhD in ethics from Vanderbilt University, her master of theological studies from Vanderbilt and her bachelor's degree in philosophy and religion, my major along with biology, uh, hers from Emory University. She is also certified in healthcare ethics consultation through the American Society for Bioethics and Medical Humanities with the HEC-C. Her talk today is entitled Moral Distress in Clinical Practice and addresses the moral issues at stake for healthcare providers that can result in vulnerability and powerlessness while utilizing a moral distress map as a tool to emulate moral distress. Um, excuse me, that's basically say, ameliorate moral distress. So it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Zinzinski. Take it away. Thank you so very much. I'm really honored um, to have been invited to do this talk and am extremely grateful for all of your time. And um, I hope that what we're doing today will be helpful to you. So let's see, you can see here, what I'm hoping to do today is define moral distress and identify some clinical examples. My entire, uh, the place that I work is entirely clinical. It is all clinicians all the time. So that's my, um, kind of scope of practice. Um, and I wanna utilize the moral distress map that I published a while ago to differentiate moral from emotional as aspects of moral distress. I will say um, with my training in the humanities, you know, I was really interested in what makes moral distress moral, right? Um, I get that it can be distressful to be doing the important work of being a clinician and taking care of patients. What makes it moral? And that was really what motivated my work here. And then hopefully together we can develop some skills and strategies for identifying and reducing moral distress for you if you're a clinician or colleagues who are if you want to help them. And I just want to start by thanking nurse scholars. The work in on moral distress has really um, been driven by nurse scholars. And these are just a few, but um, Anne Hamrick and Elizabeth Epstein on the top have done a lot of empirical work and, and come up with surveys and all kinds of things that have been extremely helpful in this area. Lucia Wolschel has also done a lot of work in talking about um, in doing some, some work in moral distress. And then Cinda Rushton also. There are many, many more, but these people have influenced me and I wanna thank them. I'm standing on their very capable shoulders. Um, okay, let's start with what we are talking about here. So there are a number of different terms that get used. And in my in the interest of making something big and nebulous like moral distress more specific, I will do what I do in my profession all the time, which is get specific. So first there's moral uncertainty. We all feel this sometimes. This is unease and questioning when the person isn't clear about the right course of action or maybe even what's going on and the moral components of what's going on. Um, ambiguity about how a moral rule or principle applies in a certain case and about the nature of an ethical dilemma or ethical issue itself. A moral dilemma is uh, actually different from what, what many people think it is. This is actually having more than one ethically justifiable course of action, and you're not sure which course of action to take. Um, there may also be a number of moral uh, of actions that you should not take, but usually there's also a number of options and you just are trying to figure out what to do. Moral distress, what we're talking about today, um, was first introduced by Andrew Jamiton, who's not a nurse, philosopher, um, and then of course, built up from there from the nurses, nurse scholars. 
Um, this is, there are many different definitions, but the one I'm going to use is the negative responses that occur when one knows the ethically appropriate co course of action, uh, but can't carry it out. So the most important, Corley came up with this description. People feel moral distress often when they're in a position where you have more responsibility than authority, which is a position nurses are in. Of course, moral distress does not apply solely to nurses, but trainees, for example, often feel it. A lot of us who aren't attending physicians and attending physicians feel it too. Um, moral residue is this notion of when we don't fully um, sort of recover from each time we feel moral distress, it means our baseline then gets higher. So our distress level at baseline continues to increase, which makes it harder and harder and harder to get over and work through each episode of moral distress. So it's that which each of us carries with us from those times in our lives when we face uh, moral distress and we have seriously compromised ourselves or feel like we've allowed ourselves to be compromised. And then finally, we're seeing more and more in the literature this notion of moral injury. I, I recommend being very careful with this term. The term uh, came up in a military context and it usually means a betrayal of somebody in authority uh, who you are uh, expecting to lead in some kind of virtuous way and they don't do that. So you're witnessing cruelty and other kinds of things. So there are some similarities, but I really kind of uh, discourage people from throwing this term around too much because it really is uh, it, it kind of closes windows and says, okay, now we're, we're so injured, it's hard to figure out how to recover. And I think there's more we can do under the moral distress umbrella. Okay. All right. So just to give you a sense here, um, here are some reflections from uh, oncology nurses. And you can see here how the different um, demarcations of either an ethical dilemma, up at the top or uh, moral distress, et cetera, and how they're marked out. Um, you can see at the very bottom, for example, I get very frustrated when I know patients aren't going to make it, yet they want everything done. I don't think they understand what will happen. Do they know they're going to be here in the hospital away from home and family and likely die here? So, so these authors note that Part of this is moral uncertainty. Did the patient receive the necessary information and support to make an informed decision to continue therapy? And another part of this is, the, is an ethical dilemma. The patient's choice for more therapy may lead to more suffering, okay? And much of what we do in ethics is help people differentiate and name some of these um, the ethical dimensions of the work that they do. So the solution to moral uncertainty is usually gathering facts, asking questions, investigating. And this is really an open enterprise where mostly we are, we are standing from a place of curiosity and we're trying to say what exactly is going on here. Everybody who knows a little bit about this situation, let's get together, let's have a meeting, um, let's read the chart, let's figure out what's really going on here. So don't treat moral uncertainty as if it's a dilemma, just get the facts and then figure out if it's a dilemma. Um, however, in a dilemma, which also comes up with some frequency in our work, um, you see conflicting but morally justifiable courses of action, and you're trying to figure out what to do. Here, you don't always need an ethics consultation. Um, clinicians do a lot of ethical reflection on their own, but sometimes in complex cases, an ethics consultation will be helpful. What you wanna do is a lot of ethical, very deliberate ethical deliberation. You wanna be multidisciplinary and collaborate and figure out if there's a compromise where uh, the various parties' uh, most cherished moral values can be upheld uh, while trying to find some middle ground. Um, and often, especially in end of life care, where a lot of ethics consultations come up at my hospitals, at least, there may be no satisfying solution. We, not, we may not feel great about any of them, but we're looking for the best of several usually sad options, but, but ethical, but sad options. Um, there are so many different definitions of moral distress. Uh, and those of you who are interested in this, 
you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of different paths you can take um, and a lot of different ways you can sort of conceive of moral distress. And I've shown you some of the ones that I think are most helpful. Um, okay. Um, so there's, in addition to feeling more responsibility than authority, there's a constraint of some kind for, for the person taking the action that they think they want to take. And we're going to, through the map, talk about how that comes up and then what actions can be taken when that occurs. And the person often also feels unable to change what's happening. And this is actually where an ethicist or others, I often work, work with spiritual care, I often work with nurse leaders when we do moral distress debriefs, we uh, are going to try to figure out how to identify something that can change, an action that people can take. So this feeling of being powerless and stuck is what we're trying to move through when, when people, our colleagues, ex experience moral distress. So this, this picture always makes me a little sad because anyone in the clinical, who works in, in the clinical environment has seen many of our colleagues in this state many times, trying to hold it together at work and really just exhausted and sad um, when they come home, in part because the work is really hard. It's been getting harder for a variety of reasons, and in part because they're just trying to do the best thing that they can. Um, and they have they have confronted so many challenges during the day and the day to day. Um, and, but this is really the face of moral distress, right? I'm off work, I'm finally getting to have my meal and I just can't stop crying or feeling sad or feeling angry or whatever it may be. Um, another thing about this is because we all have different personal values and we share some professional values, but we have different values and backgrounds, we won't all experience moral distress about the same things. There's, that's not a problem. That's true basically about everything in the moral life. It's okay. Um, some moral distress, however, is unavoidable in healthcare. There's just no way around it. And it's really because the work is so important and um, the stakes are so high. However, what we wanna do is identify the avoidable moral distress and get rid of as much of it as we can and then help people to cope with the not avoidable moral distress. Okay, so I'd just like to pause and get a little bit of interaction here through the chat. And um, I wonder what kinds of situations cause you or clinicians you work with moral distress, if you wouldn't mind putting some answers in the chat. releasing patients to homelessness. That is one we struggle with a lot at my hospital. Uh, miscare due to staffing shortages, potentially inappropriate treatment. Um, clinician partners highlighting only medical aspects, avoiding personhood aspects. Um, all of these things. Yes, pandemic, domestic violence, Thank you. We can all just share in the grief of all of this. Um, patients who are uh, don't have family or friends to, to help them and support them in a very difficult time um, when they're hospitalized, for example, that's the context in which I work, so will often be the reference I make. Um, uh, okay. Thank you very much for that. We will be looking a little bit more at some of those things in, in the slides ahead. Um, so recently there was a study done in Spain and these are ranked um, by clinicians who have said what causes them moral distress. I have bolded, I have bolded the, uh, some of the ones that I see also where we are, I mean, there's a lot of similarities obviously, but I'll say that some of the bolded ones are the ones that I see with some frequency. Um, um, and this, this 
you know, we've seen in, in that chat response, accepting the family's insistence to continue an aggressive treatment, even though I believe it is not the best treatment for the patient, for example, um, or feeling pressure to give or carry out orders, which I consider unnecessary or to administer inappropriate tests or treatment. Likewise, uh, Anne Hamrick and Elizabeth Epstein um, in 2009, um, I added the COVID example, but um, talked, you know, identified some of these other things. LST is for life sustaining, means life sustaining treatment. Um, and then, of course, during COVID, we had a special, uh, more intense kind of moral distress, um, especially in the beginning when PPE was scarce. We did not, we knew people were dying. We didn't know what risks we were taking. Um, and, and, Providers and clinicians were scared, and yet we were recycling PPE. We didn't have enough PPE, et cetera. So PP, personal protective equipment is what I mean by PPE. Um, the other thing we saw a lot in on ethics consult services uh, were lots of questions about visitor restrictions. And the, the understanding from an uh, infection control standpoint of why we had visitor restrictions, but also seeing the, the really broad uh, negative impact on patients and families of that. Of that. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the other things we're talking about is moral residue. That thing that we take with us when we haven't fully resolved uh, moral distress each time that we experience it. And um, our, our colleagues here have given us sort of a graph of that, right? So you can see that your baseline each time, with each peak, your baseline doesn't come back down to zero. And this then ends up meaning that you're sort of in this place of heightened um, uh, sort of emotional response all the time. I think maybe one or two people might have their um, uh, uh, audio on if you wouldn't mind muting it for the time being, that would be really great, thank you. And as I think about, you know, also the kind of the theme of this endowed lectureship, I also think about the spiritual components of it. Um, and those are really, really important. I was trained in religion. Um, I think this is the moral life is part of a, is an important part of the spiritual life um, and the religious life. And these are some of the things that moral distress can cause from a spiritual side, loss of meaning, crisis of faith, um, loss of feeling of loss of control, loss of self, self worth, et cetera. And as, as I've mentioned, the goal is to, so sometimes we'll get an ethics consultation and, and it's like, I have moral distress, fix it. Well, that's not what, we're not gonna be able to eliminate all of it, but we should be able to reduce or eliminate avoidable moral distress. And that's also some of what we are trying to discern as we go through the moral distress map. Another important um, resource for people is the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, the four A's to rise above moral distress. And you can see here some of the uh, strategies that they recommend, which will overlap with some of the things that um, I will be talking about in using the map. So as I was trying to think about all the many, many groups of clinicians that I've tried to sit with and help with moral distress. And I'm trying to think about what makes it moral, right? And help them through it. There are certain features of moral distress that I think are really important. So the person who experiences moral distress also feels heightened moral responsibility. In other words, this comes from a place of being um, morally responsible, right? of being a virtuous person. I worry more about people who aren't feeling anything anymore. That's somebody who's burnt out. It's really hard that they're, they're in a, a worse situation than the people who are feeling distressed about this one thing that happens because they're still in the game, right? They still have enough energy, um, uh, moral and otherwise, to sort of be invested. So uh, again, this is part of what I always say, which is the the moral bar in healthcare is high, and that is reflected here as well. Um, 
the experience of moral distress is directly related to the well-being of the patient. It is not self-centered. So harm to the clinician comes by way of perceived harm to the patient. And we see that in example after example. You know, if I said, okay, you know, your patient's suffering, go for a run. They'd be like, yeah, the run helped. Still lots of moral distress. Can we fix what's happening with my patient? And once we address that, that's when the moral distress goes away. Again, unselfish. Um, moral distress is mostly caused or accompanied by perceptions of powerlessness. And that is, as I said, what we try to address together. Another feature is that blame often underlies moral distress. The perception that, let's say, an attending physician is doing the wrong thing, and that person's choice is constraining the nurse, for example, or it can be more internal, that I should have done something. It's my own, I'm blaming myself. It's my own lack of courage or sense, sense of not being able to, be, being afraid of the repercussions, for example. That is the constraint that I'm struggling with. And finally, here's the crux of what makes it moral. At least two obligations or responsibilities are in conflict. At least one of them is a professional responsibility. It might be two professional responsibilities or one professional and one personal, right? Your own personal values. We're going to see that in action in a moment. Um, the other thing is ameliorating moral distress may involve personal risk and avoiding risk can threaten integrity. This is the first thing that people really need to be reminded of. This is true, not just of moral distress, but literally of the moral life. To be moral, you gotta be ready to take a risk, to speak up, to be told you're wrong, for someone to get angry at you. This is what it means to live a moral life. You don't need to do this all the time, but it's a part of what you gotta be ready to do. And so that willingness is something that we can stand together and say, yes, it's, it's okay for you to do this, even if someone gets mad, even if there are repercussions, this is the right thing to do for you to, to speak up. Um, we wanna distinguish between actions that ease the clinician's moral distress and actions that improve the care or experience of the patient, as I mentioned before. And so we'll talk about some of those too as we move through. Um, and really the primary goal of helping somebody with moral distress is to address the underlying ethical issues causing it. Um, and so that's where we're gonna get to fixing it, not just swirling around in the distress and letting it be this nebulous thing that has no uh, clear outline. So here's the map, okay? So basically when I sit down with clinicians, I take them through, we have a case that we're gonna talk about, we talk first about what emotions are you ex experiencing? This is because distress is emotional and people will have trouble um, trying to get to the specifics of it if you don't let them have that very human outlet of saying how they feel about it. So I always start there um, and give people a moment to sort of exhale those emotions. Then we wanna both think about sources and constraints that kind of are closely related. So in the individual case, what exactly is the source of the moral distress? Um, is it inadequate staffing? Is it you know repeated neglect of having a goals of care conversation? What is it precisely, right? And that's what we'll target then, not just everything. Um, and then the constraints, what are the internal and external constraints? And this notion of lack of courage, I wanna, even though it sounds mean to say it this way, I wanna say it that way because we have all lacked courage. This is, I have lacked courage. Everyone on this call has lacked courage. You, there are times when it is hard to go, oh my God, I gotta say something again. I've gotta do something again. It's the third time I've had this conversation. I'm, I'm exhausted, right? We've all been there. So it's nothing to be ashamed of, but it is one of the things that we have to attend to. And then, as I said, trying to identify those conflicting responsibilities. And from there, we usually get very quickly to what actions can people take, right? And these two can flow together. What possible actions could you take? And you can let people, sometimes 
in the debriefs, we let people just say, I'll say, say anything. I could quit. I could report somebody, blah, blah, blah. Even though in the end, we're, that's not what we're going to end up doing. But it allows everything to be like, there are things I have power. I'm, I have agency to do in this situation. Um, I also want to also say an equity reflection is really important every time we talk about moral distress. Um, ask yourself why this case brings it out if another similar case did not or vice versa. Um, we want to be not passively, but very actively aware and trying to systemically uh, uh, dismantle systemic injustices that impact patients, families, and staff. So that includes our own biases. Sometimes the way these, this comes about is not necessarily overt discrimination against one person or another or a group, but it's actually because we favor somebody we have a connection with. That and that can come on a lot of different lines. It may be women, you know, I'm a woman, I have a connection with this woman. It's often things like, I'm well educated, so is this patient, right? I I'm a doctor, so is the patient, right? So it's things like that. So paying attention to that privilege is also a part of that reflection. We always, as a matter of justice, want to treat like patients alike, but that never means that every patient is treated exactly the same. And that is basically what equity is showing us. And so you should feel some latitude. You don't have to treat everybody exactly the same, but you do want to generally treat like patients alike. So a couple of examples, just so everybody, we're sort of on the same page, a couple of examples. So a couple nursing vi vignettes about what caused moral distress. Um, one is a nurse student working in a nursing home and you're witnessing how your preceptor force feeds an old woman suffering from dementia in a situation of understaffing. Well, this is really loaded. I don't know what's going on here. Um, but this is something that would be really distressing because in part you're witnessing something that you think is wrong, right? But it's wrong on a, a bunch of different dimensions. It's, it's um, and you're wondering if it's about the understaffing. In other words, she's rushing through to feed this woman who needs PO help, you know, PO, uh, food and and it's hard it takes time that's a very labor intensive process it's a very time consuming process and she's in a hurry and that the negative impacts that differs from the second example which will happen right a nursing student on a psychiatric ward sometimes the patient will be in an involuntary restraint due to protect themselves or others and the patient is gonna react strongly to that physical and uh, to that intervention with physical and verbal resistance. This happens even if you're trying to actually protect and care for the patient, right? So it's not an outlier situation. It's you should expect it if you're working on the psychiatric ward, but you're trying to minimize the harms to the patient in that, in that situation. The more you can minimize those harms, the less moral distress you will feel. Um, then there are physician sources of distress, prolonging the dying process by having to provide medically futile interventions, uh, failure to have an, an end of life conversation, witnessing provision of false hope to patients and their family, or having to provide care that's not in the best interest of the patient. All of these things will, ca will cause physicians moral distress. And in general, when you see MD on my slides, it's for moral distress, not physicians. Okay, so I would like us to look at a case together and in the interest of being sure everyone can participate, I will read this case. An 84 year old woman with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer has been in the medical intensive care unit, the MICU for three weeks and lacks decision-making capacity. She has multi-system organ failure requiring mechanical ventilation lungs which is her cancer is always also about three vasopressors, so cardiac and circulatory system, and renal replacement therapy, dialysis, so kidneys, so multi-system organ failure. She does not have an advanced directive, and her three adult daughters are serving as her surrogate decision makers. The healthcare team has consulted palliative medicine regarding transition of goals of care, but the daughters have declined to speak with them. 
they want all treatment. So the, the patient remains full code, um, which means CPR will take place if, um, if her heart stops or she stops breathing. The daughters also request that their mother not receive analgesia and sedation because they want her to be alert when they visit. Given the differences of opinion between daughters and the team, the hospital has explored transfer to a facility that might be more amenable to some of the daughters' views, maybe not all, but peer institutions state that they have nothing additional to offer and have declined transfer. Medical center policy strictly prohibits placement of a DNR, do not resuscitate, and later on I call it do not attempt resuscitation, same thing order over the objection of a patient or surrogate. The nurses are distressed. They feel that they're causing the patient pain with basic interventions. Their distress is amplified by their knowledge that the entire team believes that current treatments are merely prolonging the patient's dying process. And yet they are prohibited from providing comfort care during what are likely to be her final days of life. The team is considering writing a DNR DNAR over this objection of the surrogates um, on the on a number of bases, which we won't get into. This is more about the distress, less about the, the mechanics. Um, the attending physician also notes that caring for the patient is taking a toll on the MICU staff. Nurses are asking for reassignment to avoid caring for her multiple shifts, shifts in a row because it's difficult on them, that woman crying in the chair, for example. And physicians are being reluctant to are becoming reluctant to provide updates to the to her daughters. They still do so, but less frequently. Okay. That's our case. So let's start with this. In the chat, what emotions do you think the nurses and the doctors are feeling? Anger, frustration, helplessness, guilt, impotence, helplessness, despair, sadness, overwhelm, futility, sense of futility, um, undue stress, ambiguous grief, abhorrence of cruelty, confusion, maybe even disgust, hamstrung, shame. Thank you very much, yes. Um, so this, and, and let me just ask for just one moment. Well, actually we'll get to that in a second, I'll wait. <laughs> um, good, so this is usually what causes moral distress, right? This, this, exactly, these emotions are the ones that come up, right? So, um, and we're empathizing with them. So the sources and the constraints, again, they're tied together. The sources are case specific, but often there are themes that have emerged on a unit or in a hospital or in general, right? Fail, failure, failure to have a goals of care conversation, not broaching the patient's poor prognosis with family. And this is where the blame arises. Someone else did something wrong or I didn't do what I should have done, okay? Um, and then there are the constraints to acting on one's conviction and beliefs. So sometimes those constraints are external, short staffing, you ind the individual nurse can't fix the short staffing, it's not up to them. Um, or recognition that the patient and surrogate has authority even if you disagree with their choice. So that's not about you, it's coming from outside of you. Then there's internal, that, that lack of courage, that fear that your concern will be ignored, et cetera. Um, both involve that feeling that you don't have power. So in the case that we described, can you pause and think for a moment what the source in that case of the, of the distress is and what the constraints are? And you can demark each S for source, C for constraints. external source daughter, so individual piece, or the daughter's decisions. 
Suffering of the patient constraint is the family. Autonomy, good, okay. I'll put this back up so you guys can see. Um, failure to obtain family's reasons for wanting aggressive treatment, surrogate, let's see, policy, lack of effective communication with the decision makers, um, the surrogate decision, good. Okay, so I would say, I would say the other one here is the lack of treating. So mostly ventilated patients are sedated anyway, to some degree. Not treating her comfort is going to be a huge source of pain for the nurses. And frankly, if we did an ethics consultation or a palliative care consultation, we would likely put limits on the amount of uh, on the limits that the sister, the daughters could put on that, right? Uh, while we wouldn't have to switch completely to comfort care, we would we would be saying, you know, we are still going to address um, her her comfort. It's it's sort of required in the constellation of things we have to do to care for our patients. Um, uh, lack of time and access to decision makers, et cetera. Okay. Um, legal fears, hospital administration and policy fears, uh, lack of understanding of comfort, suffering, uh, source not updating daughters as often to help them understand, that's true. But I know many people on this call are also used to a lot of, the, even, the, even when we do a lot of that and we have had conversation, gentle conversation over gentle conversation, sometimes we just perceive the same situation differently, right? And so the daughters may still feel that way. The other part thing that's happening here sometimes is that the daughters feel may feel that they are protecting their mom from us. And that's something as an ethicist I'm always paying attention to, right? If that's happening, we got to realign everybody, right? And and kind of, you know, try to fix that that distrust first and foremost. Okay. So, um, um, and the constraints here certainly are the, I wouldn't say the daughters solely, I would say the, the surrogate decision-making of the daughters, right? And the goals of care of the daughters are some of the constraints. And there might be internal fears as well, because likely by the time it gets to this place, efforts have already happened. I mean, clinicians just don't sit around and go, I hope this changes, right? Things have, people have already tried, but it's not working. And so um, now we got to figure out some other more creative um, approaches. So here, of course, people feel helpless, powerless, ashamed sometimes. And um, there's, while moral distress can, as I mentioned, it entails risk and we want to address it and diminish it. It can also lead to important insights into what's important to us, what values we have. It can also help us to realize, hey, I'm feeling a lot of distress about this thing, but maybe I can let it go because I am trying to honor the preferences of a, fa of a family member or a patient who have these values that differ from mine. That's okay, right? So Trying to really identify what that is can be important. All right. Now we've got to do the harder part, which is identify the obligations that are in conflict. And I'm going to invite you to take risks here. You do not have to get this right. Just please give it a try. You're the nurse, let's say, or you can be the doctor, whichever you want. What you have certain obligations. Um, Name two that are in conflict. Obligation to do no harm versus honoring the wishes of the family. Yes, beneficence and non-maleficence versus respect for surrogate authority. Um, obligation to provide compassionate care to patient to, and the autonomy of the surrogate, good. Um, yes. Worrying that the daughters might sue me, okay. Um, yeah, the responsibility to provide care, I think this is a subtext, which I'll say out loud, even though I think we all know it. It's this 
healthcare or well, clinicians have to care, right? <laughs> like the caring is a huge part of what they're all doing and they can care through withholding treatments, not withholding treatments, et cetera. It's not always directly related, related to the treatments, but if somebody says, don't let me comfort this person who might be uncomfortable, that interferes with the care, right? Even if we're gonna do a withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, it interferes with the care. And, um, and I think rightly in this case, we might press a little on that. Um, good, okay. My feelings of what is suffering and that I have to do what the doctor tells me to do, good. So this is another kind of ubiquitous constraint um, and conflict for nurses and trainees. They are not the final decision maker. They're not the provider. And their job is to work with the provider, but to execute on orders that are written by that provider. And that means that obligation may be in conflict with um, their belief that we should, to some extent, override the daughter's um, uh, insistence on not providing sedation and analgesia. Okay, good, good, very good. Thanks everybody. But now hopefully what you can see is it's getting more specific. We're getting more specific about what we need to do to address the ethical issue as well as to minimize moral distress. And that's sort of the point. We're not just here to talk and be sad together, um, although that can be important too. Um, and then finally, we want to think about what possible actions we can take and what final action you might take. You can choose either of these, but tell me in the chat, what are some options for the team? And then what do you think you should do in this case? Oops, sorry. Goodbye out there. Yeah, feeling obligated to get to the root of why the daughters want the patient to be alert while preserving dignity and respect. Hello, Kelly. Um, let's see. Quit. Yeah. You can get an ethics consult for sure. Um, uh, get really dig, maybe find new ways to dig to the root of where the daughters, why the daughters think this. Sometimes after a long period of time, we come to find out my uncle died from this and this is what happened. And, and the clinicians are able to say, oh, I'm glad you told me that story. This situation is really different. Let me show you how it's different, right? But sometimes it takes us a while because they aren't even thinking of it until we ask the right questions. Um, draw on standards of care for prevent support pain relief and use them, exactly. So to say there are certain things that surrogates can say yes or no to, and there are certain things that are part of the continuum of care, part of the whole package of care that they really don't have a right to say yes or no to. And that's one of the things that comes up here is really the autonomy of surrogates is to say yes or no to beneficial treatments that are offered by the attending physician. They can talk to the attending about any of the things they have in their own minds about what they wanna talk about. But in the end, they, they can consent or not consent to what's offered based on the clinical assessment of that team. They don't get to say, none of us as surrogates get to say, here's what I want, please do it doctor. Okay, and so helping the team now as an ethics consultant or as a nurse manager or whoever or a spiritual care provider or whoever you are to see that there are limits there. Now we can start to do something to address the ethical issue that's causing the distress. Okay, promote consensus as much as possible. Excellent. Consensus among the clinicians in particular is important. So if some key players caring for the patient really think that what they're, what the daughters are doing makes perfect sense or the patient isn't in very much pain or whatever it may be. That need, people need to sit down and talk about that because it's not really fair to go to this daughters. Hey, we think, and you wouldn't say it this way, but you know, we 
we aren't going to accept everything that you're saying because of this when there are differences of, of opinion clinically. So you got to address those together. Meet with the daughters to try to get to the bottom of why they're requesting the care. Regular interdisciplinary team meetings, pain consult, palliative care and hospice care for sure. Um, meet with chaplains, escalate to leadership, set boundaries around pain issues, et cetera. So now we've got some ideas that actually give us a plan. And now the hard part will be, how do we execute the plan, right? And this is where, okay, so now things are getting better. Okay, something specific we can do. Now, we know that moral distress can lead, lead to all of these things. And we're trying to make sure it doesn't in this and all other cases. And we are looking for individual moral resilience. And at the same time, we don't want to insult people by saying, just go for a run, right? Just have a glass of wine with your friend. It'll be okay. No, institutional action is important, right? Clinical action from the leader of the team is important. And, and we can do both of these things at the same time. And resilience comes from doing them together. Take care of yourself and then figure out together what we're going to do as providers, as a team for this patient. So some of the actions we can take to ameliorate moral distress include taking action together. I, this is so hard to do alone. So you don't have to agree that, that with the person's assessment of moral distress, you can say, I don't agree. I, this isn't actually causing me moral distress, but we're nurses and we should be able to speak up and tell somebody if we're having concerns and certainly ethics and a bunch of other, other staff are gonna support you in that. So you want to you want to speak up. And this is often how many of us together can figure out how do you speak up, right? If it's about an attending physician that you feel like often maybe doesn't want to doesn't listen as well, let's figure out together a good way to get that person's attention. Respectful, right? Um, we can help you problem solve in ethics and you have some problem solving tools, ethical problem solving tools you can marshal. So we'll do that. Sometimes this might lead to, hey, we need to we need to sort of codify how we're having these conversations and codify, for example, that um, certain pain, you know, that that some of these treatments all go together and that we will not accept the separation. Maybe that needs to be articulated more clearly somewhere. Um, and then on the coping side, you're going to listen and investigate because you're going to have moral uncertainty even as this unfolds. Then there's moral moral uncertainty and then you're addressing that. Storytelling and debriefing because you're together. This is a spiritual aspect of it as well. You're together talking and supporting each other. It's very powerful and important and it should not be uh, diminished. Um, you can cry, laugh, complain, get mad. Always use respectful language, always, even when behind closed doors. This is a habit and it helps you to not have bad feelings for, for patients and, fa and family members. So you still use respectful language, but you can get mad and you can complain way away from the sisters, right? But that's okay. Um, be deliberate in the decisions you're making. Get help if you're trying to figure out what decision needs to be made. If you have to have a hard conversation with those sisters and you need help, get it, right? Um, focus on changes in work environment that preserve moral integrity and also that um, preserve the idea that, or the culture where it is okay to raise ethical concerns. Nothing is more important to a healthy working environment than people respectfully and with openness and curiosity, as well as, you know, clear clarity. Um, being able to say, I have a question. I'm concerned about this. Can I? Can we talk about it? The answer should be yes. Um, interdisciplinary problem solving and taking action together. And then really the blame game, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you get through the moral distress. It's not going to help. Whatever's happened in the past, we're just going to turn forward. Yes, it might mean that we're going to maybe use some different techniques with a couple of folks. But in the end, just leave what's in the past in the past. So basically, um, in conclusion, clinicians' moral and professional values are important and deserve attention for their sake and for the patient's sake. Clinicians do have power and influence. 
even small things can make a big difference. And every, you also, I also want clinicians to be like, I did this small thing and then they dismiss it. Like, no, that was a moral act, right? In doing this. It was a moral act in saying to the sisters, I am uncomfortable not providing pain medicine. That's a moral act. So you just keep taking these small moral acts and clinical acts, and it moves you through, empowers, and, and leads to a better solution. Everybody needs support. So find people who will listen and support you. They don't have to agree with you. And certainly ethics is standing there to support you, spiritual care, social work. There are lots of us who are here to support you. Create and insist on an ethical climate where professionals are encouraged to respectfully exercise their moral agency. There's, you can't work anywhere else. So here are a couple of other resources um, that you can take a look at. Uh, if you would like to look, and you're welcome to look up my article too. And uh, I hope that today is a very, very moral distress-free day for everyone. And with that, I will, um, I will pause. And do you want me to stop sharing? Sure. Why don't you do that? Thank you, Professor sure. Dzinski. That was an outstanding talk. Um, one of the things I'm very interested in is um, healthcare professionalism. And I see this as a fundamental and powerful tool that can be utilized at times of moral distress. I recall 40 years ago as an intern, um, there was a patient who was terminally ill and had coded. And there was already the full complement of people surrounding the patient in resuscitation. I walked in, I grabbed the chart, I turned to the collected attending and resident physicians above me in the power uh, structure and said, you need to stop the code. He was made DNR three days ago. And they looked at me and I said, and it has not been rescinded since. And then it finally the chief resident said, call the code. So. There are times when you know, you're know you forced to do things, particularly as you said, house officers commonly get thrust into the role of, I gotta do it, but there are, and that's why I referred to it with the case, standards of care. And professionalism can be a very powerful tool to combat circumstances when there appears to be an intractable moral dilemma. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Other questions? Could you elaborate on the danger of the term moral injury? Is it being inappropriately applied to healthcare? From Kelly. It, yes, I think sometimes it is. I think I I think there are probably times where, where it applies, but my worry is actually that the more we we accelerate this, the more we're boxed into a corner. If, if this is about empowerment, the more we escalate what this is happening with the way we talk about it, the less people feel empowered to change anything. They feel more and more like they're the victims of what somebody else did. And that's why I find it constraining as a term. Not everyone agrees with me, right? But I find it constraining. I want to, I, every time, whether someone's talking about moral injury, moral distress, I'm like, what are we going to do? Let's do it, right? Um, and that can mean institutional action, right? It, it's, it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, right? And I work at an institutional level. We can help with that. Um, so that's my, my worry. And I'm putting in uh, for everyone the CME link because I've uh, seen feedback that someone was having problem with the QR code. Okay. Um, Ruth Smith says, uh, the moral distress I experienced for the nurses at their doctors who won't listen, they won't change. There is nothing that the nurses think that they can do. Dr. Dukas. Do you mind if I ask you as a physician what, what you might recommend? There are lunk-headed people in all strata of healthcare professionalism. 
Um, there are ways of trying to engage people like that, but also depending on your academic or hospital environment, also if it's more heinous in terms of the level of disregard uh, where people can be um, reported for professionalism lapses. So if someone was disregarding something which was impacting satisfactory and standard of care health treatment for a patient, it is actually the obligation of the witnessing healthcare provider to say, yes, there's a difficulty here with the way Dr. Smith went ahead and did this, that, and the other, or ignored our concerns about this, that, or the other. Ultimately, these things all fall on, under the domain and uh, regulatory control of the chief of staff of the facility. His or her name is on the line when anyone is acting off the guidelines of appropriate professional care and violating standards of care for patient care. Yes. Thank you very much. I don't know if we're out of time. Um, yes, we are. So I want to thank you so very much for your time today, Professor Dzinski. And please, uh, again, if you go to the chat, you can sign in for CME. Uh, this lecture, as well as all of our lectures, are on our web page. If you meander to Tulane Bioethics, you will find yourself there under Williams Lectures. And thank you so much, and have a wonderful day and weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Denise.